Good evening. This is the Oscar expert here with Brother Bro, and we're back after a long Oscar season. You know, we we stretch, we recovered, we cleansed, and now we're ready for a new Oscar season. I've seen more people than ever just embracing the early Oscar season predictions because it is fun in itself. Just like the end of the year where you can see how many films right you get, it's fun early in the year to see how many films you can get like with, with, yeah. with almost no knowledge of the film. If you're not into the early predictions, like you're not like a top tier Oscar <laughs> follower, which is fine, but like, it's fun when you get like all the way in that you're like, oh, I know what's supposed to get nominated. Yeah, there are a lot of people March. who are like, I'm not interested in predicting before we've seen the movies. And it's like, huh? That's like part of it. That's but just the part point of it. is you like, can get a few right. You can absolutely get a few right. And last year we actually had a worse early predictions track record than I think any year that we've done it. I don't, know, I don't know why that is. Like, I think it's because, like, okay, obviously Top Gun was was something that we, we didn't predict. All quiet, coming. nobody we, was We even had everything ever on. So well, a couple missing. movies moved. Killers of Flower Moon moved. The movies that I have on my top ten, I'm I'm more certain that they're not going to move. I agree. That's, like, kind of also a factor. I think we need to I prioritize consider. that. I, we can't I, just I look into the future that. and yep. say, okay, this movie is coming out at some point. Let's put it on the list. Before beginning this video, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that you're all watching me right now to promote a personal unmovie related project that I've been working on for the past year. It's music. I got an album coming out. I made some weirdo electronic music. I'm sorry to say it, I'm not singing on it. It's coming out Friday, March 24th. There's a single out now. I'm gonna link that in the description. Streaming on Spotify, streaming on Apple Music. Come up with a fun trend to dance to it on TikTok. Now back to predicting Barbie. Number one, I don't think it's winning Best Picture, but here's the thing, look. I tried to look for like, what's the alternate contender that we don't see coming? That's from a director who's never had a movie nominated before, which sneaks into the race. Look, nobody was ever gonna think that was Coda. Everything Everywhere came out like already. So it's like a movie we saw, like you could maybe go off that. I just don't think there's much to go off of to like determine what that movie yeah. is. Cause that is kind of the trend lately is that, you know, the Spielberg movie, the, the Babylon, the giant mega Oscar bait movie doesn't usually win best picture. But what is the one movie that we really think is going to get nominated? Like if I had to bet on any movie, Kills of the Flower Moon is Martin Scorsese. We, we all know about this because last year we thought it was coming out. DiCaprio, Jesse Plemons, Lily Gladstone, they're all going to get nominated for this, okay? It has lots of big production elements that could also, you know, go along and get nominated too. And it might even be going to Cannes Film Festival. I'd be very excited that I get to see it. Apple TV is behind it. We know what they did with Coda. So that's just an easy number one, okay? It's kind of a placeholder. I don't actually think it's going to win, but people, you know, if it premieres at Cannes, it's certainly going to be the early front runner and everyone's going to say, oh, it's undeniable this movie's winning Best Picture until like December and then something else is gonna happen. That's all how, always how it goes. I mean, it could go like that, but I think people are gonna be even more weary than ever. They're gonna start to realize that that's like a very strong trend, you know, where even even the Fablemans last year, with amazing reviews out of TIFF and winning the festival, just what didn't even win any Oscars. Also, I wanna point out that last year, you know, speaking of mistakes, we had Babylon at number one. I think a lot of people had it in their top five. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it made sense to predict Babylon for a bunch of awards. But just saying, you know, anything can happen. And why do I have past lives at number two so high? It's not necessarily because I think it's gonna be number two to win. Like maybe it will be, I don't know. But you know, the fact that we've seen past lives, we know that it's one of the best movies of the year. We know that critics are gonna say it's one of the top three. That was one of our justifications for everything everywhere really early on. It's gonna be one of the critics top three of the year and the critics awards are gonna go for it. And we can't doubt A24 anymore. However, I would say last year A24's films had mega stars in them, the ones that were Oscar contenders, from Jamie Lee Curtis and Michelle Yeoh to Brendan Fraser and his whole comeback story. Like, Past Lives maybe has a problem in that the cast and crew is relatively unknown. I think it's kind of like Minari, though. Minari, also, people will argue, oh, that was only because it was a pandemic year. You know, maybe so, but I honestly think Past Lives will have even more acclaim. I think it's going to stick... In, in in the 90s, like in the 90s on Metacritic, absolutely, and people will be having absolutely. their number one. If it's people's number one of the year, what are you going to do? I think it can get screenplay director, actress, supporting actor, potentially, you know, maybe throw a tech in there, like score or something. I don't know. I'm really excited about Past Lives. And also, let me remind you, if you're like one of the most acclaimed movies of the year, 
If you look at Metacritic's top 10, the top three were in Best Picture. Everything ever were Tar Banshees. Other than that, you had Top Gun and The Fablemans in the top 10. Past Lives has like a guarantee for me of being in the top five for, for this list. I just really think it's happening. If someone's trying to deny it because they're saying, we have to wait to see what comes out. If the movie is there and the quality's there, we don't have to wait and see. Other movies have to prove themselves to be even worthy of past lives, and they're not going to be. They're not going to be. Past lives is really fucking good. It is coming out in May, but A24 knows what they're doing now, because they, they know that having everything everywhere come out in March helped. Not only was it, like, fine that it came out in March, I think it helped. That movie had months to itself to dominate not only the box office, but the discussion around movies. Right, I think that it, it stakes out a territory for itself to grow and form its own identity. And I think they're confident enough that, it, that they know it could be rock solid. It's not gonna be a box office smash like Everything Everywhere, obviously. I'm a little worried about it being a little muted. If Past Lives came out in the Fall Festival, it would worry me that the box office would interfere because we saw that box office for Tar and for Banshees was just like, okay, it wasn't amazing because they were all competing. They're all eating, they're all they're eating each, other. each other. Could Past Lives win? Some people will ask. It's hard for me to imagine Past Lives getting a bunch of Oscars, like wins, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I can see screenplay maybe. The fact that I can see screenplay, it's a reach to say that A24 will have two winners in a row and like that's why I'm not gonna like yeah. go ahead and predict that. It's a little too optimistic I think, like, but- Could it, it win screenplay? director picture screenplay? I'm gonna say sure, but as a, a, a fellow who w was open to the idea that everything ever could win best picture like very early on, I'm not very convinced this would win. At number three is Dune part two. I guess there's a world where the movie is like maybe as good as the first or, or less good and people Avatar are like coming out Meh. and proving itself but everybody who reads the books tells me that this is where we're going to get into like the meat of the story i think it's i mean denis good. villeneuve is nothing but consistent and dune part yeah, one exactly. did a great job setting up the world i think dune part two will be more acclaimed than the first i it think would be that's, bizarre i think that's what it's building to is like this is really where the story plays out and gets interesting talking about sequels and like whether or not they're going to disappoint you uh, Blade Runner 2049, people love that movie. He, he's not going to disappoint. I think it'll be interesting to see how this movie does in the text because I don't think I'm, we're going to see it winning like all the same tech awards as the first. I think that they're going to mm. want to like be a little bit different maybe. Yeah. That, that'll be interesting though. I don't know how that's going to work because they right. gave the first so many awards right. like off the bat. Well, they gave it a lot of awards in a pandemic year. Could Doom Part 2 win? I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't think it's going to have that same like narrative thing. I'm not really convinced it's going to get like a SAG Ensemble, like all the actors nominated. I mean, of course, if it got like a SAG Ensemble nomination, I'd say like, oh God, what's happening to this mm -hmm. movie? But I think the technical juggernauts tend not to win Best Picture like as of lately. Oh, yeah. Saltburn, number four. The That's new film really from Emerald Fennell, Promising Young Woman, was obviously a big hit and, and a movie not everybody was expecting to do so well. A lot of times when you enter the Oscar conversation, it's not like your second movie is going to be another hit. Well, there have been test screening reactions. They've been very good. They've been very good. Mm -hmm. They're saying Barry Keoghan is amazing in the lead. So I'm like, okay, then you can nominate Barry Keoghan. You can do Rosamund Pike supporting. By the way, a lot of people think it's Rosamund Pike lead Barry Keoghan supporting. They didn't read about the uh, test screenings and stuff like that. People say it is like the talented Mr. Ripley. The fact that people say it's good and that some people have said they even liked it better than Promising Young Woman. People say like, it also feels like a step up for Emerald and, Fennell and, in terms and of the, her filmmaking craft. And the cinematography is being done by Linus Sangren, who did mm. La La Land and First Man, they say that's a step up. By the way, the plot is a college student develops an obsession with his affluent classmate. That's Jacob Lordy is the affluent classmate. So it sounds like a really fun uh, movie that's bound to be acclaimed. I don't know why I would go against it. And, and I think and, it's going to be like a, f a festival. And, and well acted, well written. That's, that's yeah. usually the key. The Color Purple. Hard to deny. It's a juggernaut. Hard to deny at this point because it is based on the musical Color Purple. This is the kind of project where it doesn't even need to get amazing reviews to get in. My God, is this movie going to get acted? Acting nominations. Mm. The first color purple got three acting nominations, and you could see acting nominations for Fantasia Barino in lead, and then Daniel Brooks and Taraji P. Henson could also get nominated. Those roles are just begging to be nominated. It has a uh, Christmas kind of season release date. That's December. typical with musicals, and yeah. it makes sense it's as typical. like that post festival kind of Oscar contender. You have Dan Lauston, my God, doing the cinematography. It's a stacked movie, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's just a big Warner Brothers extravaganza. Like, I don't know what to say. Oppenheimer? I'm not gonna deny Oppenheimer. Don't I'm not going to deny. Gonna deny. Look, Don't. anything can happen with a Nolan movie. We all know that. I'm not saying that Oppenheimer yeah. is locked or a sure thing, but unlike Tenet, 
it is not really like an action film. In fact, Dunkirk was like Nolan going kind of Oscar bait, you know, doing a war film. Like, of course, it's more Oscar bait than anything he's done. This is a biopic Mm -hmm. about the guy who invented the atomic bomb. And it's like a character study. So has Nolan done a more Oscar baity movie than this? Like, I guess Dunkirk is like the only one that's like more straight up bait. And this is not really an action movie, even though the trailers are cut like an action movie and they sound like an action movie. The climax of the film is the atomic bomb testing in New Mexico. I have an easy time understanding who this movie is for and who will will like this movie. Dads. And Killian Murphy could get nominated. I don't yeah. know about oh, the supporting yeah. cast. I'm not really convinced I'm about I'm really excited. Cast. I think many people are that like Killian Murphy could get an Oscar nomination for this. Because he's playing such a conflicted figure. He's so conflicted. At seven, I have poor things. Now, last year, I did deny this movie. And the reason I said is like, Maybe it's kind of weird. It's this weird, like, kind of Victorian, kind of sci-fi. But you know what? The more I look into it, I think, why isn't this, like, the right amount of weird? Because now exactly. you got to think, like, being weird, standing out, I feel like that is actually a strength. And well, that was a strength absolutely. of the favorite as well. Thinking that Yorgos Lanthimos is just going to lean into his strengths makes me think, okay, well, then people are going to like your movie. It's going to be acclaimed, and then, and then it can get awards. And the performances, I think, are going to be really That's fun. That's the other thing. I the thought performances Emma might be Stone really is, fun. is, like, may get nominated for lead actress. Absolutely. There are multiple people in supporting who can get nominated. Now, I will say, this isn't an acting predictions video, but people are like, oh, we could see Mark Ruffalo or Will Nafoe nominated. It's like... You gotta think outside the box, buddy, because a lot of times people think, and this is just a lesson for early predictions in general, people think, I'm just gonna predict everybody who normally gets nominated, who's a big actor who gets nominated all the time. What you're missing is that the biggest supporting role in this movie is actually gonna be Rami Youssef, who's never been nominated before. Maybe he's the one who gets nominated. And people will always, always, every single year, without fault, predict that Willem Dafoe will get nominated and win or, or win for a supporting performance he's in a film. Regardless of what the role is, what have you found about this performance? Is it a big performance? Is it something that could get nominated? I think it'll be he'll be really good, but I think it'll be like in the beginning of the movie mostly, and then he kind of disappears because he really just kind of gives birth to this like Bella Baxter Frankenstein type of character, and then I think that's really his role. Like in Nightmare Alley, he was only really in the beginning of the movie. It could be similar to that. You never know. Time, I mean, if the movie's huge, it could be time to honor him. It is time to honor him. But I the want movie to be has an Oscar, to, but I like, know, but like even know. Jamie Lee Curtis. Let's think about that. The movie is gonna have hella costumes and production yeah, design probably i mean the cinematography the score well i don't know if there's gonna be a score it could be like classical music and people are just fans of yorgos lanthimos at this point i think people yeah. are really excited for what he does yeah and 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 the novel this is based on is very acclaimed and it's said to be very thought-provoking have interesting commentary on like gender it just seems like weird and and funny in the way that could be like perfect if they pull it off yeah. and, and lanthimos is good so i feel like he's gonna pull it off i think we used to look at films and go like oh well is it like relevant are people gonna resonate with it is it like culturally relevant and actually if i look at last year's films i don't see most of them having a message that is like catered towards our times so i think the bigger correlation is like do people like the movie if you win it's important i think to have yeah, that extra I bump. think but when I it comes down to winning, it's important. I'm not gonna predict movies that like, oh, it's it's this is tackling a social issue. Like that must be in the conversation. I don't think that's really how it's been working out for the last couple of years. Even though, sure, that's the time we live in. I can look at you know the Fablemans, Top Gun, Avatar. It's also hard to say. Poor things is gonna be too Lanthimosy. As in, it's going to be Killing of a Sacred Deer or the Lobster. Because one reason we had confidence in the favorite, it was not written by Yorgos Lanthimos. And we thought that was a good sign. And it proved to be true. And the same writer of the favorite is doing this film. And it is not written by Yorgos Lanthimos. I think it waters down his weird instincts just enough to make a movie that, like, everybody can enjoy. Barbie at number eight. This is perhaps an ambitious move, but I, don't I, know I feel that is. I have good justification I don't, I actually it. feel good about this for, for, for a reason. One thing we try to do is look at, you know, what sections of the year could films come out of and emerge from, because what doesn't happen that people seem to think happens a lot, and we've fallen for this before, is, is thinking that all of the movies that get nominated for next year's Oscars are just gonna happen at the festivals because those are the movies that want to be nominated for Oscars. We have to look at the summer, we have to look at, you know, if anything's coming out at Cannes. Yeah, but the year before, I will say, we didn't get any summer movies or anything like that. Kodak actually did come out in the summer, basically. It was basically released in like early September August. or August. And we got a very populous Oscars this year. And the box office is back. So for a couple of years, we did not see a lot of box office films make it into the Oscar race, but now we're seeing more. What about the fact that it's the Barbie movie? It's not a kid's movie. I, I think I know who this is for, and that's what's important. 
This is for adults who played with Barbies. And you have Gerwig directing it and writing it with Noah Baumbach, her husband, at her side right as the writer. It has a cast that absolutely appeals to adults. A-list cast. Sag Ensemble, perhaps. Sag that could Ensemble, be one of perhaps. the funnest adapted screenplay nominations. People are saying it's a super fun movie. I think it's gonna do really well at the box yeah, office. I've Everyone knows it's coming out, and people are really excited to see it. It's gonna do well at the box office, all right? This is a project I'm really looking forward to. I've heard some things about this movie. I've heard that it has costumes and production design nominations walking in the door, and could win. And could win, from what I have heard about the way that they crafted this world. The movie tackles, like, gender roles and stuff like that. And I guess probably, like, you know, body image and all that stuff that you kind of could expect about what Barbie represents yeah. in our capitalistic world. Greta Gerwig is interested in this project because she is going to dissect those things. And that's what she did. And people say it's interesting. That's why I was telling you yesterday, this movie is going to dominate the conversation around movies for, like, a while. I think this is going to dominate like the cultural yeah. conversation and people yeah. are going to have a lot of interesting takes on it. Some people will be very upset, but all of that is just going to help this yeah. movie have a lot of relevancy and possibly, like, you know, just, nice just imagine it. Like Twitter starts popping off from the earlier views and then it comes out and then it's it's doing box it's doing really good box office. That's the recipe. Honestly, that's all the movie needs. And people, it does need good reviews. But it doesn't need like everybody to love it. It just needs enough people to really like it. I still think there's a world where, you know, the internet loves it, but it's just like people are like, no. Like, will critics groups not think people. It is the I think if it proves itself to be worthy of being taken seriously, that's that's important. And I think it will do that. And also the text. And uh, not only costumes production design, I'm talking potential song nomination, because I heard there are fucking songs in the movie. Mm -hmm. Makeup and hair is very possible as well. And then Ryan Gosling supporting actor. I heard he's like actually like <laughs> worthy of a nomination and critics will There's push him. There's already a lot of buzz around. Yeah, him. he actually might be worthy of a nomination and critics are going to push him and give him awards. Like yeah. I swear to god he's actually going to do really well. That's important if you get an actor in there. And then adapted screenplay. I mean, first of all, that's the less crowded category and you have Gerwig Bombach duo that you can nominate there. It'd be like super fun. I don't know if this movie gets into director and lead actress. Those could be. I don't know. If it's I, really I, I feel strong. like lead actress doesn't have hype. Director would even be more likely to me than lead actress. It's gonna have a fuck ton of style. Yeah. I mean, it's her stamp is all over it. Her stamp's gonna be all over it. And already, the movie has appealed to the world of film by doing the 2001 reference. Like it's exactly. like a cinema lovers movie. Is the is the other thing. It's like a highbrow movie. That's what I'm saying. It's PG-13. It's, it's not movie. even for children. <laughs> if if you're a child who likes to play with Barbies, your parents like won't let you go to the movie. It's really weird. It's like. Can I see the Barbie movie? It's like, actually, you can't. Actually, you can't. It's not for you. It's like, but, but like I have uh, my, but I'm playing with the Barbie. It's like, actually, it's not for you. Like, the movie's you, not you for have you. Barbie, Barbie Mariposa. You have like Barbie Dream Mansion <laughs> animated in 3D. Like that's your move. That's your yeah. Barbie movie. This is ours. This is ours. I'm excited and I'm willing to be wrong on it because I don't know why not. Like we're probably gonna be wrong about a lot of stuff anyway. I'm more excited to predict this than other stuff because going for movies like this. Works. This is also I mean, I don't the know, kind I, of movie that's never been nominated before. Like something that is just based exactly. off a product. Like it's weird, but it's also weird exactly. enough where if it's done in an artful enough way, people can say, I don't care what it's based on. Like I think it's a cool. Well, movie. I'll also remind you that, you know, the Facebook movie was nominated mm, for a lot that's, of awards. That's still no, but a if you remember, though. if you remember when it was coming out, people were like, that's the Facebook movie. Like, isn't that the movie about Facebook and at the time Facebook was this social platform that like kids use to like upload selfies and it was like Yeah, I guess so. Oh, is that serious? The other weird thing is that we have three movies from Warner Brothers in the top 10. I don't know, like I'm okay with it because I feel like each of them has a good chance on their own and yeah. at this point I'm not going to play chess where I'm like, oh, these two are getting in. It's like, I don't know, one of them's going to fall probably somehow, so yeah. I don't really care. Like whatever, if I got two out of three, that'd be great. Another movie that's pretty close to being in the top 10 is The Holdovers, which is the new Alexander Payne film. Yeah. Now he's kind of flopped with downsizing, but this one is Paul Giamatti, and this could be a good way to make up for not nominating him for Sideways if they're really thinking about that. Paul Giamatti's playing a teacher, and there's a, somebody who's playing like his student who he has to stay with over like the Christmas break. And then Divine Joy Randolph is playing the school chef who comes from, you know, like a very different background from like Paul Giamatti, and they're like a group of people who doesn't seem like they get along. And then over the Christmas break, because it's a Christmas spirited movie, they come together and they whatever they share about their lives. I think that Divine Joy Randolph could get nominated as a supporting actress for this movie. And she has like a family member who died in Vietnam or something like that. Obviously, Alexander Payne has kind of been an Academy favorite. I don't know if that still stands. That could be acting, writing movie. Paul Giamatti is also playing like a dislikable character, which I, I'm really happy 
with. It could be like a little like cheesy in like a Christmas movie way. I'm not uh, if if that makes sense. But there's been like pretty good buzz about it too. I've heard like people are excited and Focus Features is excited. They think that they have something. In fact, I've read a little bit more about this movie that has caused me to put it in my top ten. Apparently, this movie screened for buyers at Toronto last year. There was one person who reported that they thought it was the best movie of the festival that nobody else saw, and Focus Features clearly thought so as well. They bought a movie for thirty million dollars, and apparently there was a pretty big betting war for the movie. So they are not buying the movie for $30 million for nothing. This is clearly focus features, try and have an Oscar push. It's not really bad to have one focus features film in your best picture predictions either. We're gonna talk about Air. Now, just earlier today, I was like, fuck no, no, no. <laughs> because this movie premiered at South By. It had very good reviews, rapturous reactions, and people saying like, oh, this movie's a slam dunk. It's a winner. The audience loved it. There was energy and goodwill for, you know, Ben Affleck especially and the cast. And then I saw like on Letterboxd, there's like a 3.6, you know, most of the ratings are seven or eight. And I'm like, okay, it's a seven or an eight, big deal. Now, mm. a crowd pleaser dad movie like this, I could see it just doing okay and then, you know, kind of fizzling out and then critics are not really paying enough attention to it to revive it at the end of the year. But I would have also said that about Elvis. Oh, the critics don't like Elvis that much. And then lo and behold, the critics groups actually like Elvis. So who am I to say that a good campaign for this movie couldn't have it revived with critics groups, which is often a good way mm. to bring a movie back into the conversation if it's an early year release. Yeah, I think you've convinced me that it is fair to consider whether this movie could be nominated because people are talking about it in terms of awards and the people who've seen it are getting excited about awards prospects. So what are the prospects here? Picture, screenplay, which people say is sharp, editing, which people say is pretty good, and supporting actress for Viola Davis. That's kind of yeah. it. That's enough. And Viola Davis, I heard, is maybe the MVP or the standout of the cast. Yeah. I've heard a lot about her where I'm like, oh, easily if the movie's not and, and then it's like, like there's a decent ensemble here that makes me think, you know, if this is an award contender, if it's a best picture contender, then we could see a side ensemble nomination. Yeah. Apparently the cast has like eight really good performances. So honestly, a case has built in my mind for the movie. I do think though I'm I'm still kind of weary at the fact that maybe the movie is just good but not great to people. But mm. Really what I would like to see with this movie is, how's the box office? Yeah. Because when it comes to early year movies, I think a strong box office is really important to whether or not you're going to last to the end of the year in awards season. Mm. So if this movie has legs at the box office, would it be an indicator of strong word of mouth? Even if it just did mid at box office, I'd be like, Okay, so the movie kind of came and went, didn't it? I don't know what the box office power of this movie is. I mean, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck certainly it's probably didn't not seem to have that much power with The Last Duel. Also, don't underestimate people who like sports going out to see That is also movie. true. There's a lot of people you just think so? taking phone calls and being like, yes! On the movie's very, 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 very best day, it can get best actor Matt Damon and best director, but that's a little bit of a God long damn. shot to me. You think, and you I think, think the Matt actor, Damon the actor actually... race looks strong to me. But people like Matt Damon, but it's like, it would have to be a pretty weak race. Like, if that movie was getting into best picture last year, maybe Matt Damon could have made it into that back best actor race. Rotten Tomatoes, it actually has a good chance of getting, like, a high 90. Like, it's going to be above 90, I think, because no one doesn't like it. And Letterboxd also seems to indicate that nobody does not like it. I was not struck by the trailer or anything about this movie. I was like, all right, fine. Like, this is this movie looks like it's going to come and go. It's like a real crowd, crowd pleaser. I mean, people are saying, like, they, 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 they want to get up and go, yeah, yeah, ugh. Yeah, but it, I, I still just wonder if it's like a 7 or an 8 for people. And if it did happen, I'd be like, ooh, like, I, I could have put that in the top 10. Well, I think we... I think there actually is like a, a reason to make it number 10. But I do like dumb money there. We can make it number 11 and just be like, okay, that was like pretty The close. reason that it could be number 10 is because if we know it's possible, that's like good enough to put in the 10. Maybe, but like, I, I, I also feel like it's jumping the gun a little bit. And people are just absolutely. getting excited to call something early. It absolutely is. I mean, maybe I'll see it like next week and be like, yeah. Too many sevens for me though. Too many sevens, you know? It does have too many sevens for me. Amazon does have salt burn though. Kind of fucking if it smashes the box office, I'll put it in. Have it there. I know. I was having a hard time with this, but I ultimately put dumb money. In 2021, we remember the short squeeze that a bunch of random people who gathered on Reddit did to the GameStop stock, and mm. then Wall Street went crazy about it, and then immediately after, a nonfiction novel was written about it, and immediately after, the movie went into production, now the movie's coming out. In mm. like the span of two years, we yeah. have a movie about it already. It seems... I was actually shocked that 
not only are we having a movie come out this year about it, but that there was already a novel that already did really well. I was like, wait, that seems really fast. I mean, some people might be skeptical and be like, eh, this is just like Hollywood trying to like capitalize off of this situation. But like, I mean, you could make it into a pretty compelling story. Like you could probably get me pretty interested in it if you tell yeah. it in the right way. And the director is Craig Gillespie, who did I, Tanya mm -hmm. and Cruella. And I think that's a pretty good choice. It's a pretty uh, solid way. Like, okay, what would the package be here? if? Someone was getting hyped up for a supporting actor like Paul Dano or mm -hmm. Seth Rogen. More likely Paul Dano. I mean, if this is like yeah. an ensemble piece and everybody if goes If he was in the Oscar conversation again and he failed again, it but would I be, at that point, it'd be like a, a curse. I mean, I understand why he wasn't nominated for Fablemans, though. But for this movie, he's uh, the top build in the cast. So if everybody goes supporting and then he doesn't get nominated and the movie's nominated for Best Picture, that would be fucking absurd. I he could go lead and not get nominated for lead, and I'd be like, okay, well, that was because he was lead. Yeah, but um, I think they could. They, it might be an ensemble piece, too. Yeah. This movie has an October like 20th release date. The studio is like, we are putting this movie in the fall. We're going to try for awards. That's what I yeah. think I'm seeing here. It's like, they yeah. just think that's I mean, it could also movie. be a she said. It yeah, but it's, said. it seems like it will be funny and light and perhaps like a big short. Yeah, I mean, everybody's going to be comparing it to big short because it's a topical film about uh, the market and uh, its volatility in the 21st century. And I would um, also say, given Craig Gillespie and his style with I, and what he did with I, Tanya, I would say I could easily see the movie being like very entertaining and snappy. Yeah. And getting an editing nomination. The other thing is that screenplay does feel like pretty compelling. Number nine, you tell me if you're okay with this. I mean, this is kind of where I think we, I don't know if we agree on the rest of the list. I have the Bob Marley biopic. Now, a lot of people think this is not coming out this year because if you look it up, it says it has a 2024 release date. Why don't you check that release date, friendo? Because it's actually coming out January 12th, 2024. That's a confirmed release date. So you have to ask yourself the follow-up question. Is the studio releasing a Bob Marley biopic with Kingsley Benadire playing Bob Marley and Lashana Lynch playing his wife from the director of King Richard and the writer of King Richard? Are they releasing that in January just for no reason with no Oscar consideration? Or are they going to put it in limited release and qualify for the Oscars? That's obviously what they're going to do. Yeah, That's but January is not a great time to release your movie because you have to really break in. You have to break into the current conversation and you don't have a spot for yourself. So you have to elbow some people out of the way and be really good. I really liked King Richard, but I don't necessarily trust that Renaro Marcus Green is going to have like hit after hit. Really, Bob Marley is one of the most widely like beloved musical figures. And I think there's something slightly different about this movie in that he was maybe not the biggest like rock star and he gets up on the stage and people are like, fuck you and like throwing bottles. And then he's like, Darn! when he like, you know, like rocks everybody's world. And maybe it's not so much of like a live concert movie where we get to see all the live performances in real time. Like musical biopics are as smashing the box office as ever. You don't even need to be amazing, but I don't know. I'm skeptical of this release date. But don't you think Kingsley Benadir will be nominated for playing Bob Marley? I don't know. Don't you it think he will be nominated for playing don't Bob Marley? Don't you think that Whitney Houston movie is going to get nominated for lead actress? Don't you think that? Terrence Winter is one of the writers. Terrence Winter wrote The Wolf of Wall Street. And um, I think Bob Marley is just such a giant. Like, everybody loves really Bob is. Marley, you know? Yeah. If the movie isn't I Want to Dance with Somebody, if it's not, like, that level of it just comes out and fuck it, he <laughs> will be talked about for a nomination. Oh, j he's going to get nominated. I don't think it's going to be nothing. It's hard to There's deny, another yeah. music biopic about Amy Winehouse, but I think that's more likely to be the under the radar one. I, I, I gotta say, it is a very compelling case for best actor. And when you're in best actor and you're really strong, often your movies are too. May, December, I did a bad job explaining the May, December plot. So I'm going to re-explain it. Julianne Moore and Charles Melton are a Hollywood couple. They had a tabloid romance 30 years ago that was very controversial because there's a large age gap between the two, which could also produce controversy for the movie itself, depending on how it's tackled. But the movie really follows Natalie Portman as the protagonist who is doing research for a film that she's doing because she is playing the Julianne Moore character in an upcoming movie and she's studying her. You can count on the production elements being stellar and the acting being stellar, so that's like, yeah, that's pretty good. Definitely the acting being stellar. But, but no, I mean, yeah. he doesn't do an Oscar contender every time he does a film. He did Dark Waters and Wonderstruck. Carol was extremely close, but didn't, but missed the Best Picture nomination. It would have gotten it in a 10. I don't know. I have a feeling it could be a contender that falls down a little bit, though. Because with Todd Haynes, I think you have to be really good in one of the best movies of the year. I agree, because it's not going to be for everybody. If it's one of the most critically acclaimed films of the year, you can be Tar or Banshees and get nominated. All right, Maestro. 
you've been holding in your where's maestro for a while now and and now we're gonna you know explain to you where maestro is and why it's here i think maestro will be the very big Oscar bait movie that just doesn't happen to get in. You gotta just be honest, man. The reason you think this is because some people have seen it. I heard some test screenings went meh. That's all I'll say. And it also didn't seem like the reactions were like, oh, it's meh, but it's such a crowd pleaser, it's undeniable. It wasn't even like that. It was like, it's like a huh movie in a weird way. It's like, that's, that's kind of the vibe that I got. Now, Bradley Cooper, I've heard nothing but good things about him and Carrie Mulligan in the lead roles. And the makeup and looks the fucking makeup, insane. And the cinematography, I've heard very good things about. So, you know, there are crafts and there are actors, but you wonder if maybe just this is like the movie this year that just doesn't like happen. Wait, we have no Netflix movies in the top 10. We can't do that. That's like well, hard well, to call. Well, Maestro is definitely their biggest movie right now. Yeah, I mean, they have the killer. But remember last year, it was like Bardo was their biggest movie and that fell and then they screamed scrambled and everybody scrambled and then it was all, and then quiet. all quiet emerged it's hard like, to tell maybe maestro just gets in and it's like it does have mixed reviews and it has a rocky road to the oscars but at the end of the day it just gets in and it's like okay i guess kind of like man we'll see maybe critics will like this more than audience I, I have no idea but it's just you know i i would have thought that the test screening reactions would have been a little bit more rousing given like what he did with the star is born so i'm just gonna like try to call that as you know the the big contender everybody thinks is unmissable that misses maybe i'm wrong i can eat my words and be happy to eat them i would have had blitz on but my problem is that i'm not 100 percent sure it's coming out this year it kind of feels it, like a film that would be moved to next year and then everyone starts i agree a lot blitz is apple tv they do have killers of the flower moon there's no rush to put it out because they you know have a contender this it's year in production too blitz is the new steve mcqueen movie it's about londoners during the blitz of world war ii learning to navigate the new normal so it's like this period in which the germans were like bombing the british and the british people had to like adapt to this new way of life and like the government was like doing shit like lockdowns and blackouts you know it has a great cast there's sarah sharonin it has stephen graham bafta nominee stephen graham and harris dickinson and aaron kellyman is also probably going to be a pretty big role in it so this is like a big oscar type of movie like it's world war ii shit it's steve mcqueen it's the cinematographer that he used on the small axe series it's going to be good i don't think that this is going to be like widows where the oscars are like no, because it's like a crime thriller. Like this is definitely up their alley, it seems. That's like another one that could be pretty strong, but it's rushing out to be done by the end of the year. It's not necessarily rushing. I it don't is think rushing. they've ever announced a release date, so they don't even know if they're right, rushing. Right, so I, w I might just not put it in because I'm like, that might get moved. And also Apple TV, they have Killers of the Flower Moon this year. That is their priority. If they're really mm. confident, they will move it. Let's talk about the killer, because I think a lot of people are just going to see David Fincher and just throw that one up there. I have no doubt that the killer is going to be good. David Fincher is very consistent. So for Fincher's films, like what genre movie, what mystery, thriller, action movie has gotten in that he's done? There hasn't been one. He's had Mank, The Social Network, and he's had Benjamin Button, and that's it. Girl the Dragon Tattoo got like five noms. Oh yeah, because it, it, it came actress. close, if you remember, but Gone Girl was okay, supposed to get... Close. Girl with the Dragon tattooed, yeah, and it got, right. like, snubbed a lot. It, it did. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, David Fincher seems hit or miss with the Academy, and this could be one of his miss moments. Will it get nominated for something? Probably. Is it sound? Is it editing? Is it, you know, an acting award? Score? Cinematography? Maybe. I mean, it's going to be as stacked and good-looking and good-sounding as anything he does. But when it comes to Best Picture, I think it's fair to say maybe this is just in line with like those thrillers and those crime movies that he does. The other thing that, that makes me skeptical is, um, let me read this plot. An assassin begins to psychologically crack as he develops a conscience, even as his clients continue to demand his skills. So honestly, it sounds a little cliche to me. Like it's this hardened person I'm supposed to kill. I am made to kill. I am a killer. And then the person's like, oh my god, like there's like a child and, and, and this child it needs me and then and now I'm not so sure about my job. And I kind of doubt it's going to come across that way. I, I understand. I think, I think it's going to be fresh, but the concept doesn't make me think Oscar contender. Yeah, the I agree. only thing that makes me think Oscar contender is the fact that David Fincher is making it. Michael Fassbender is in the lead and, you know, maybe he's really good and maybe he's And Tilda Swinton, actor. I think, could have an interesting supporting role as well. Yeah. So and, maybe, you know, and Netflix is behind be it, so they will somewhere. campaign the movie, like, Definitely. however they can. And they'll see they'll see if people respond to it. I don't mean to cast doubt on, like, the movie as a whole. Like, it could be really good. I loved Gone Girl and that didn't get a lot of nominations. So Gone that's Girl where I'm was really from. weird because everybody liked that movie. I Critics, know, And it did well at the box office. And it just didn't yeah it was that was weird flint strong this is actually directed by rachel morrison this will be her directorial debut oscar nominated cinematographer 
written by Barry Jenkins. It is about a boxer from Flint, Michigan, who becomes the first woman in her country's history to win an Olympic gold medal in the sport. So this could be an inspiring sports drama that also touches on like some American social issues. I'm thinking King Richard when I think about that. Something that touches sports and also feels like the kind of Oscar-y, Beatty drama that we're used to. Ryan Destiny's in the lead role. She has not really approached the awards conversation before. Brian Tyree Henry, though, he is the coach in this movie. I think that is an interesting well, goodness. supporting role. Well, goodness. I mean, a, a coach role like Sylvester Stallone and Creed, I mean, mm. It would be interesting to see him get a supporting actor nomination two years in a row. There's a lot of potential for it. That's why I, I want to have it in the top 20. I think there's a lot of potential for it. Oh, it's also MGM, which is maybe like a little bit of a red flag at this point, considering women talking. Till did not do well. I mean, Licorice Pizza I don't think it's a red flag. minimally, minimally embraced. It's if like it's Till. the right movie, then it does well. I don't think it's like the movie's gonna be anything groundbreaking. I don't really have like a feeling here or there about it. It definitely has potential. Asteroid City is one of two Wes Anderson movies that may come out this year. This one is kind of destined to be like the more prestige one. It is very likely, it seems, to premiere at Cannes, just like French Dispatch, and it will come out in the summer. It has a massive, massive cast, the likes of which are comparable or even like more staggering than the stacked cast of Budapest Hotel and French Dispatch. I do have that fear with this movie that it's gonna be just such an ensemble piece that I'm like, who am I supposed to be attached to? That's the thing, is that that's the that's a problem with his films, I think. Well, with the French Dispatch, it was literally like a lot of stories. And that's actually the problem with Wes Anderson's other film that will be coming out this year. Uh, to Netflix, that's why I have that one much lower. But Asteroid City, you can say all these stars are in it, but what it's really about is a junior stargazing convention, and a lot of the main characters are gonna be teenagers. They're gonna be people we probably don't know much about. And the cast of the movie is like a lot of like the parents and the instructors or whoever around them. Also, if you think about like, which movies have worked really well for him, they have had like a lead central character like the Grand Budapest mm -hmm. Hotel. This is also said to be a romance. Moonrise Kingdom was a romance. That's one of my favorite West Moonrise Kingdom movies. came close to a Best Picture nomination. It is going to be impossible to predict who is like the supporting contender for this movie until we see it. Like truly will be impossible. And also nobody's ever been nominated for a Wes Anderson movie as an actor. So that just might continue. But you can like kind of make up whoever you want and say, oh, Hong Chao will get it. Tom Hanks will get it. Like you can just make that up and just say, oh, well, it's their time. They deserve a nomination but like, like you just don't know you just don't know what kind of role they're gonna have they could be in it for a minute this cast is actually fucking absurd absurd to the point where i'm like this is actually dumb i just don't have enough confidence to put this in the top 10 given that wes anderson's only had one best picture nominee yeah asteroid city needs to be a grand budapest hotel or, or greater and that's hard to do but i think maybe someday he'll come back to the oscar conversation i don't think that they're like done with him necessarily We've all seen the trailer. It looks great. This runtime was announced to be 179 minutes, so it's going to be a three-hour movie. I mean, look, they got it down. They were, like, wrestling with a four-hour cut, then a three-and-a-half-hour cut. Mm. Now it's three hours. This is not quite a horror movie, it seems. Joaquin Phoenix a is going to be... A three-hour horror movie would be nuts and also, like, unpressed. I mean, The Exorcist was it long too. as fuck. It chapter two. Oh, but this, this movie, movie just great. seems like a Charlie Kaufman movie. I mean, clearly influenced by Charlie Kaufman. I am excited as heck. It has got to be one of my top five most anticipated movies this year. Yeah. There are some rumors that producers were saying that like the movie's kind of a mess and they're like worried about the length and stuff like that. But Oh, really? I mean, yeah. But like, of course, producers are worried about the three hour movie. People might really respect it. People know Ari Aster. I know they do. They, He's they're a household like, fucking name. Like, so well that they're like, oh yeah, you start talking about Midsummer, and then you, you have to talk about Hereditary after. You can't talk about one of his movies and not talk about the other. Randos know who Ari Aster is. Complete Absolutely. randos. Yeah, Bo is Afraid is going to do fine at the box office. Like, it's going to be fine. And, and Joaquin Phoenix... I think he's going to be great. I think this could be one of his most interesting performances. Definitely. And the cast definitely. seems good. I don't know and if anybody's... People fucking love Joaquin Phoenix. The last movie that he did that everybody saw was Joker. That everybody saw. Yeah, well, it didn't work for Come On, Come On, did it? Even that everybody that saw. Amazing. Okay, yeah. If we're going to put an Ari Aster movie on for Best Picture, what factors, like, reduce the amount of risk to me? Well, it's not really a horror movie. Like, 
I'm, maybe some people will make the argument that it's a horror movie, but that's like it loose, at that point loosely. At it. that point, it's so loose that I don't care. The production design, the yeah, there's some there's some elements that look like they could go along with it, like the yeah. production design. Yeah. Also, Joaquin Phoenix having a lead role like this, if it were to get in, it could have acting stuff come along with it. Joaquin For Phoenix sure. looks fucking amazing. Amy Ryan could maybe be like a supporting actress. There are a couple supporting actress possibilities in this too. And cinematography, I love the cinematography in his films. Someone said it's only about the film that surprised me because it made me think wow this like this trailer couldn't show it but this film is like raunchy and really weird like really out no, there no there are some times where i watch the trailer very slowly and i pause and i'm like what is going on here and how are we gonna like get there it's gonna be nuts and it will probably be somewhat divisive i don't think that ari aster yeah. is a filmmaker who wants to please everybody i mean look at the ending of his last two films i have a desire to put this higher in my predictions actually i just see great potential i see a movie that i like it kind of reminds me of watching the trailer for something like everything everywhere or get out where i'm like that looks really original and cool and fun and i'm interested in what's going to happen in the story i would prefer to predict this over lee okay i won't predict lee no no, no i just i'm just saying like <laughs> i would rather be predicting a film like this for awards even if it doesn't come true rather than lee or something that I just have a really strong feeling is not going to get good reviews. Can you imagine, though, if Past Lives and this got in? That's the other thing. And and two movies from earlier in the year? Well, A24 almost had two movies this year get into Best They Picture. did almost. Bo is Afraid is probably not going to be nominated. It's probably going to be too strange, too bizarre for people. And not in a way that, like, everything ever kind of ties it up in this nice little bow. Probably right. in a way that, like, people don't know what to make of it. And then there's Rustin, which is Netflix. We had this pretty high last year. Coleman Domingo, I think, is going to get nominated for Best Actor here because he is playing a civil rights activist who organized the March on Washington. There's a big supporting cast in this film, but from what I have heard, there's not actually like a standout among them that would get nominated. Whereas last year we were kind of like, oh, maybe Audra McDonald or Chris Rock or Glenn Turman gets nominated. That's not going to happen. But Coleman Domingo's like actually giving like a huge baity performance. It's amazing. And at that point, I kind of think, you know, what does this get nominated for if it's in picture? Screenplay actor? Is that really it? And I've also heard maybe the movie's good, like pretty solid, but not like revolutionary, not saying anything that maybe we haven't heard. Whereas now I feel like if you do kind of like a typical civil rights message, it's like, yeah, okay. Maybe we're looking for something like Judas and the Black Messiah, sort of something we haven't quite heard before. Maybe this one doesn't quite deliver that. It's also very possible that people feel like nominating Coleman Domingo for lead actor is just enough and the movie doesn't necessarily need more and that's the most important part of the movie. I am really excited that Coleman Domingo is finally going to be in a lead actor conversation for awards. And also that he's just in a lead performance because he's been excellent in so many supporting roles. And I feel like that nomination alone might be like the movie's prize. How Do You Live? The movie that Miyazaki came out of retirement to make and it's gonna be his final movie. The man is old, the man is a legend. Well, gonna be his final movie. I mean, people thought Oh, he's old Wind enough, Rises. I think it's actually gonna be People thought it was movie. Wind Rises, though. I know, but I think this is actually gonna be it. Another fun fact about this movie is that this is a six-year project. It takes them six they've years been, They've been working a long time to hand animate time. this movie, which is yep. crazy and very cool. Absolutely insane. It's based on a book that Miyazaki himself loves called How Do You Live? But the story, like the plot and the characters are not adapted from the book. It seems that a character in his story, in Miyazaki's story, reads the book and is inspired by the book. And that actually gives me hope because apparently How Do You Live is like a very life lessons-y book. And I would not want a film to just like deliver life lessons at me and, and think that it's profound. And I am still worried that this movie is going to do that. It is Miyazaki's like favorite book of all time though. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of passion in it. I mean, the fact that he came out of retirement, working on it for years. Wikipedia also says it has been described as a big fantastical film. There's also conversation like, hey, Nominate him for director. We kind of had this conversation about Del Toro last year with Pinocchio. You know, Pinocchio, while it was very acclaimed, while a lot of people liked it, I don't think it broke 80 on Metacritic. I think this movie would have to be like really fucking good to get best picture. And, and yeah. I'm not gonna say that if it got best picture, he couldn't get director because of how much of a legend he is, how much of a that's, that's, he is. That's like easy to imagine. If this movie gets best picture, 
The package is simple, my friend. It's picture, director, screenplay, international, animated. That's it. Or like maybe score or something like that. Oh yeah. Or, or sound, I don't know. Like sound categories. Yeah. Don't only... Probably Spirited more Away would have deserved a score nomination. For Absolutely. Sure. Like, the composer did do Spirited Away and Wind Rises. The movie's done. It has a 125 minute runtime. It is going to come out in Japan in mid-July. I recall many a time, such as last year, Park Chang-wook, he would deserve a Best Director nomination. We need to make a, a movie happen for picture. And the movie doesn't take off and it gets stuff for international feature even. Or a hero, Oscar Ferrati. You know, we would love to see him get in the best director conversation. Maybe his movie gets in, gets snubbed for international feature. So like, just because a director could have their time, does you know, you don't know if the movie they're gonna make is gonna be like the best movie they've made. And with this, I think it would have to be like a top three Miyazaki movie and God, the bar is high. It would have to get a 90 on Metacritic or something to get into best picture. It would have to get above a 90 on Metacritic. The, the, the bar's high. We have to acknowledge that. He can't just like make another movie that's like the win. I mean, The Wind Rises was very good and it was very acclaimed, but like even that, I think he would have to make a movie better than that. And if he made a movie that was very good, people would start predicting it and then they would later be proven wrong. Like Pinocchio. Pinocchio was very good, but was it like a fucking masterpiece? Like undisputed masterpiece to people? I think this movie really has to be like a masterpiece to get nominated. It would be amazing if Miyazaki got a director nomination. That would be like so yeah. amazing. I would love it so much. But again, we would just, all love it and it would happen. This it movie happen. just has to, it's just a very high bar. I think the bar is possible to reach. It has to be like one of the be very best movies of the year, undoubtedly. Yeah. People weren't talking about The Wind Rises as one of the best films of the year. Some people thought it was, but you know, as far as I recall, it was short lived. Like it didn't have this prolonged conversation about how it was like so amazing. Ferrari is a new film from Michael Mann who has not had an Oscar contender since The Insider, I believe. And Adam Driver is playing Enzo Ferrari. And this is basically, I mean, if it didn't already seem like it, this is potential to be this year's Ford v Ferrari. There are gonna be racing scenes. It's a yeah. $100 million budget movie. So it is gonna yeah. have like big budget racing scenes and yep. that could put it into the conversation for sound editing. Yep. And Michael Mann is very acclaimed filmmaker. But it kind of is like an action he hasn't, movie. He hasn't made an Oscar contender in a while. I know. It's like how ba Baz Luhrmann did come back for Elvis, you know, and he made something that contended for Oscars. Michael Mann could do that. I mean, Adam and Driver, like, is he going to get nominated for this? Like, I'm not sure. It's kind of funny. But it, it is like a biopic. I mean, you also have Penelope Cruz, who's playing, I think, his wife. Maybe it's a little too much like Ford v. Ferrari for people. It is weirdly, it is weirdly a repeat of Ford v. Ferrari. Night Bitch, Marielle Heller's new film. This is based on a novel in which a woman who's like the mother to an infant starts to believe that she's turning into a dog. And I believe that in the book, she like does turn into a dog, but like in a psychological way. It's not like a family drama where like, she's a talking puppy and she's mothering her infant and it's and she's like dragging it around by like her mouth. Like, it's not really like that, more psychological. But it, you know, the book apparently is, you know, kind of dissecting themes about like, motherhood and interesting stuff like that. And that makes me see like, oh, I can understand why Marielle Heller wants to tackle this. Amy Adams is in the lead role. You know, Can You Ever Forgive Me was great. Won't You Be in My Neighbor? I am in the minority opinion thing that was not great, but both those movies were nominated for at least one Oscar. Maybe actress adapted screenplay contender. Like I could see those two. Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. People were predicting it for awards, like really hard. And yet it was a weird movie that like, if a studio was trying to market an awards movie, they wouldn't have let that script go through. It was just strange. Night Bitch, it's probably not a film that's like tailor-made for awards. But it's like psychologically, it will be interesting. And for Amy Adams, I think there's a lot there. That's fine. Actress adapted screenplay, go from there. That's what my argument is. Fine. The Bike Riders. I don't know if this should be like this low. I kind of moved it down after like, I, I might even be weighing like test screenings too much. I, I, I saw one reaction that said like, the movie's good. And I was like, that's kind of what I was worried about. It's like, triggering with, me. It's with triggering Jeff Nichols, me. I'm yep. kind of like, yeah, that's the, been the problem with like some of his films, like movies. Loving. It's like the movie's Not good. Them. I'll take shelter. People thought it was like great and mud. A lot of his recent movies have been like good but not great it takes place over a decade as we follow like these vandals who form this by bi this bike rider group tom hardy apparently the lead austin butler kind of debatably almost like the lead too and jody comer is in it as well this says that it is in the tradition of films like the outsiders and goodfellas so it might be more along the lines of those films than like an easy rider yeah but this movie you know it, it does it is a period film and it does seem like to some extent it might have that nostalgic element like midnight special for some kind of old Hollywood filmmaking. And I think that it could, you know, evoke that for members and that's always a plus. But, you know, my fear is that the movie is just like, 
Good. And, you know, like Loving, it doesn't propel him into the Oscar race. I think Challengers is the new Luca Guadagnino film. This has Zendaya, Mike Feist, and Josh O'Connor. This is like possibly a rom-com. It is a tennis- Calm? It doesn't say that calm. Oh, oh, it, oh, I've heard that it's calm. And it's a tennis movie where Zendaya is married to Mike Feist. I, I believe Mike Feist. And then what happens is that Mike Feist, Zendaya's husband, has to challenge her ex, Josh O'Connor, to a tennis match. What are they gonna do? On and off the court stuff. Yeah, you know okay, saying? but listen to me. Just look at the cast, look at the director, consider Bones and All. This is going to be a movie that is just appealing to like, Twitter and Letterbox. I just think it's like a movie for young people, like possibly yeah. up down to the genre, down to the cast for yeah. sure. Like Stan Luca Twitter. Guadagnino is becoming the voice for Gen Z after Bones and All. I think we just leave it there. I don't think this is going to be like a big deal for awards, but yeah. it could be a really good movie. Bones and All is fucking great. Foe is the new film from Garth Davis, who directed Lion, who Magdalene. also directed Mary Magdalene, which was just like a nothing movie. Now he's doing a completely different kind of movie, a sci-fi thriller based on a novel from Ian Reid, who was the writer of I'm Thinking of Anything. So this might actually be kind of a totally weird different concept movie. It's not going to be like a Passengers type sci-fi where it's like a huge budget, I don't think. Set slightly in the future after a severe climate change has ruined farmland, a farmer and his wife struggle on one of the last remaining farms until a knock on the door changes things. And the knock on the door is going to come from Aaron Pierre's character. I won't spoil everything about what I've read about the plot, but it seems like the core of the movie is really trying to explore like relationships. Sarah Sharon and Paul Mescal. Oscar nominated actors. It's it is a very appealing cast. Interesting. It is the cinematographer of Son of Saul and The Nest from Sean Durkin. And it is the composer of After Sun and The Stranger last year. Both scores very good. Like Lion will be very well produced all around. I'm excited. I don't know like what it is though. That's kind of my reservation right now. The Nickel Boys, given the subject matter and like the novel that this is based on, it is very interesting. The novel is actually like a Pulitzer Prize winning thing and it was on like Time's Best Books of the Decade or something. It's also the writer of The Underground Railroad, for those of us who know Barry Jenkins' miniseries, the book that that was based off of. Anjanue Ellis is in it. She's not the lead. It's actually a really dark but like important subject matter. There was a reform school in Florida called the Dozier School for Boys. And after 110 years, they shut it down because there was a lot of mistreatment going on. That's an understatement. Like there were fucking like mass graves like at the school. Like they were like fucking killing children or something like that. I think the majority of the students who died were black. It was like a reform school. I think it's for like, you know, people who were like supposed to go to prison or something. The novel it's based on is really like the promising aspect of this. I actually shouldn't say that the director is not promising because they actually did the Oscar nominated documentary Hell County this morning this evening. This is another MGM film. It says that it has a 30 million dollar budget too. It's a pretty big question mark for me. Like I just don't know like what is going to happen with it but definitely one to keep an eye out on. That's all I can really say at this point. That is pretty interesting. Yeah I think if this gets announced for fall festivals it will rise in everybody's predictions. Oh it could definitely be a TIFF premiere. I could see that. Lee is directed by Ellen Curris, who was the cinematographer on Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and is also a documentarian. And TV uh, director. Who was nominated for an Oscar for a documentary. This is a World War II film about a photographer played by Kate Winslet, who's a correspondent for Vogue magazine. And you know, the set photos have Kate Winslet in her like little army gear. And there's a lot of like set design, explosions going off and stuff like that. It also has a good cast. Oscar nominee Andrea Riseborough. Alexander Skarsgård, Andy Samberg, Marion Cotillard, Noemi Merlant. This is like a prestige movie. Weirdly though, it doesn't have a distributor. I don't know what that's about. And I that actually don't know if that's like a red flag or not. Also, Desplat is doing the score. I don't have a good feeling about Lee. The story isn't interesting to me. It's like Vogue cover model, Lee Miller, travels to the front lines of World War II as a photojournalist, goes on a mission to expose the hidden truths of Nazi Germany. But in the aftermath of betrayal, she becomes a, a reckoning about the truth of her own past. I, I do not like anything I just read. A lot of Kate Winslet projects have also been like not yeah, I don't feel this. Yeah, we can move this slower. Um, I feel like I see a lot of World War II movies that like try to take on like the weight of the Holocaust, you know, because it's a little bit about that too. It's about exposing that. Most of them just don't work. Strangers is a new film from Andrew High, who is known for directing 45 Years, very good movie. Weekend, another critically acclaimed drama, and Lean on Pete, also critically acclaimed drama. So this guy's consistent. Is there a reason to believe that this is like, oh, him breaking out in the Oscar race? I mean, I guess not really. Basically, this new movie tells the story of a screenwriter, like movies who are that are about like screenwriters, after an encounter with his neighbor is pulled back to his childhood home where he discovers that his long dead parents 
are living and look the same age as he is now. Paul Meskel is actually playing Andrew Scott's neighbor and the two have a relationship. Claire Foy and Jamie Bell will be playing the protagonist's parents depicted at a younger age in like a ghostly way. It's a little bit of like a ghost story in a sense. It seems like it has this very like kind of tender delicate story where i could see maybe this movie working is like it premieres at some festival like venice or something and it may be a slow burn but like it kind of leaves everybody devastated and it becomes one of the most buzzed about movies and has an idea on metacritic that is the yeah. scenario where this movie could get in because andrew high has a good track record of movies he, yeah because he's sort. consistent and stuff yeah. but his movies are a little more slow paced but 45 years to be fair is an oscar nominated film just the possibility that it could be one of the most acclaimed movies of the year maybe it's just the eternal daughter though and it's like some people's shit, but then most people are like, yeah, most people are staying away from this. Or, yeah. or maybe it's The Lost Daughter. I don't know. The Iron Claw is an upcoming A24 movie. It was a sports film about the Von Erichs, a dynasty of wrestlers who made a great impact on the sport from the 60s to the present day. So this is like Foxcatcher-esque. The director Sean Durkin, who, who did, did Martha Marcy, May Marlene, and The Nest. Also a reason I think it could be Foxcatcher-esque. It's Durkin's about a wrestling got, family. Sean Durkin's got his style and his sensibilities that are, you know, again, he's sort of uncompromised. Anti-academy, I would almost yeah. add. Very slow burn, very slow burn. But very good performances in his films. Yeah. And you have Zac Efron, Harris Dickinson, Jeremy Allen White, and Lily James in some of the bigger roles here. I don't think there's that much to say. I but it will also like that. probably be good. That's the other thing. Fine. Good and well acted and well made. If you put it at Venice or TIFF, it'll be one uh, like a hot ticket too. You know, it'll be like an, it's like an anticipated movie. Yeah, probably it's no nominations. Good. Probably no nominations, I agree. The Boys in the Boat is a George Clooney film which at this point, I know he had one movie that got nominated. At this point, it's not even a plus. It's not even it, No, like... I would say at this point, that's like a red flag or, or an orange flag okay, or something. Yeah, yeah. A 1930s set story centered on the University of Washington's rowing team from their Depression era beginnings to winning gold at the Olympics. So this is Man. another film that's about the Olympics. This is based on a story that has very good reviews from what I've seen. People find it to be very triumphant, very inspiring. So it's probably a really good true story. Joel Edgerton is in it. Look, you're gonna go through the cat of the crew, you're gonna find people who have done stuff, but ultimately like, I don't see a George Clooney, just another George Clooney movie about like athletes becoming yeah. a Oscar contender. It's just one of these movies that's destined to be at the bottom of the list the whole year and then we realize the reviews aren't good and then it just Yeah, I feel off. like it's gonna be this year's 13 Lives though. Like if we're getting a sports drama this year, it's probably uh flint air is sort of a sports drama though i guess you could say air lee and boys in the boat should be at the bottom of the fucking list <laughs> no no seriously well okay, they should maybe, be at the bottom maybe, like maybe. i i think Bo. Is, like for example when you look at more exciting movies like Bo is afraid this is the shift that we need to make the okay Bo of is afraid this is the new jonathan glazer film now normally saying like oh the director of under the skin that's like no uncompromising vision but this is a little different right because it's based sort of. on a novel it doesn't seem to be like a surrealist film it's about a nazi officer who falls in love with the camp commandant's daughter now the weird thing about this movie is that it is a holocaust film but it is from the perspective of the Nazi. Now, you read something, I think, that said that Jonathan Glazer is going to make an effort to kind of delve into the perspective of the people like in the camp, like the actual victims. But that's what the book's about. I think perspective might be the more experimental element of the film, though, because it might actually change perspectives. And well, stuff I like read that. something, it's just a rumor, but that they were experimenting with making two different cuts of the movie from two different perspectives. So that goes to show that this is a very art house targeted film because they would never do that and never even consider it if they weren't just targeting like art house. Yeah. So this isn't some Nazi Germany World War II biopic. This is a more artful exploration of perspective and trying to understand like how people can be bystanders to something so atrocious. And I think the problem with this is that this is such a difficult thing for many, most people to reconcile with. And I think today people often lack the nuance to even like attempt to under try to understand why somebody would would do these things they just want to say like that's an evil person all that that person is their entire being everything about them is irredeemable and evil and so they won't engage with this movie at all that seems to be a problem i'm interested in this movie because like why wouldn't you want to explore where evil comes from and like how that happens instead you just want to be like oh well evil exists and i'm just can i just condemn it you know we all might be doing evil things right now and we just don't even know it because our perspectives are limited they're definitely not going to premiere this movie at tiff they will premiere it in europe 
at Cannes or Venice, that is what's going to happen. It's probably not done for Cannes. It doesn't seem like it. Seems interesting. Kind of a reach to say be an awards movie, but you never know. The cinematographer is also Lucas Zoll, who did Cold War, Ida, and I'm Thinking yep. of Anything. So yep. like, I'm gonna. It could I'm, be like I'm gonna really just a little well, bit. I'm gonna it could be really, bit. really good and well made. And I, I would know. love if Mika Levi did the score again. The Book of Clarence. This is the new film from James Samuel, who did The Heart of They Fall, which was a very well acted, very well crafted film that acted mostly as just like a fun homage to older films while kind of putting like this new spin on it, like, you know, putting the all black cast in it. And I feel like we might be getting that but with the biblical epic genre, which is interesting. And there's a huge stack cast for this one too. But the main character is played by Lakeith Stanfield. James Samuel operates very much in genre. So if he were to have an awards movie, it would just have to be a really fucking good genre film, which is like cool. I am very willing to look out for films like that as something that could get into an Oscars race and just keep it like a little less stale. Especially last year, we had a lot of films that felt like they weren't supposed to be awards contenders, be awards contenders. This film, you know, it actually does feel like an awards contender in some ways. It's like a period epic. But again, like we have to remember that James Samuel's sensibilities are like, he just wants to have a lot of fun. He's even composing it. So it's going to have like his musical stamp, which was a very interesting yep. aspect of The Heart of They Fall. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Honestly, like why not throw this into the best picture predictions? Maybe if the first film came out earlier in the year, mm -hmm. people could have taken more time to warm up to it because really I remember this movie coming out very late and it was really known for just kind of taking down The Incredibles to an animated feature and that's really like all yeah. it did. But if this movie had more time, I think people could have started maybe the conversation about it getting into more categories. Yep. I like, don't know if it would have like worked. Like sound or score. However, I do think that the fan base for Spider-Verse is still probably like pretty young. You know, people who are like really appreciating new styles of animation and also superhero films. I don't know if the Academy is like super into Spider-Verse, but that well, movie has a great legacy. If this movie is on par, and I, I've heard a couple early reactions that it actually is on par. Who knows? Like, I'm not, I'm not going to say that that couldn't happen. Yeah. The first film was so revolutionary in people's minds, and I agree that if it started off early in the year, there could have been a conversation surrounding a potential Best Picture nomination. And also it ending up on more top 10 lists, which would have really helped it. It is a part one though. Most likely they'll just throw it in the animated feature category. Yeah. About Dry Grasses, this is the new film from Nuri Bilj Salin, who is one of the most well-respected auteurs and a can regular. Turkish filmmaker, did Once Upon a Time in Anatolia and Winter Sleep, very good movies. Everything he does is like really highly acclaimed and he has a new film coming out likely going to can that's like his home base what reason is there to believe that you know all of his movies none of them has been nominated for even international feature like what reason is there to believe that this is going to be an Oscar or none it's just like maybe like what if and what if the director's branch gets behind it or something like that i feel like in another universe Winter Sleep could have been like a drive my car type of contender. We really were like looking out for international films and this is one of the only ones that I could find that I'm like, I would put that in my top five for like what international films could get nominated. That's like a top five. You know, again, it has to be like the director's best film and that's hard to beat because he has so many good ones. I think it could the be The fact like that Drive films. My Car happened, like, God yeah. damn. I think that maybe did open a door for a movie like this to walk through. Priscilla is the new movie from Sofia Coppola and it is about the wife of Elvis. Jacob Elordi's playing Elvis. This is unfortunately timed. I think a lot of people review it as being like, oh, another Elvis movie, which is probably unfair because it's Sofia not Coppola- Elvis movie. Yes, it is. It's about the wife of Elvis. Yeah, and Elvis is a major character it's in it. It's not gonna be about Elvis. He's going to be a major character in it. It's once again Sofia Coppola exploring like fame and being in proximity to very famous people. So I'm definitely willing to give this movie a chance. She does her own thing and good for her, but she's not making bait. Like this is not going to be some exception to the rule. You know, it could have a lot of costumes and stuff like that. And maybe the lead actress will be very good, Kaylee Spaney. Here is the new Robert Zemeckis film. That alone makes you think, okay, like Robert Zemeckis definitely not on his hot streak right now, just coming off of Pinocchio as well as like Welcome to Marwin. But you know what, The Walk was good and Flight was very good. But this one's like weirdly ambitious and sounds like Cloud Atlas in a weird way. And 3,000 Years of Longing too. It yeah. sounds like that as it well. It does sound like that as well. I just think probably not. Like it's, it's, it's about weird. one room, but the story takes place from a hundred and something years into the future. And then all the way back, like billions of years in billions? the past. Billions or trillions, it was something crazy. It's based on a graphic novel and the way that the novel does this is it has like an image of the room and then certain boxes will be like 
this corner of the room in like the 1700s and this corner of the room in the future. I don't know how they're going to translate this for a movie. I don't know if they're going to have like in Cloud Atlas, Tom Hanks and Robin Wright playing people from different generations. I think that could be a little That's cringe. That's what I'm going to think is going to happen. That, unless maybe there's just a predominant story like at the center of it. Also, and it's just like everything. Else also, listen. Kind of this is like this is why I think I actually have good reason to believe because the cast is very small. The cast is small. Yeah. Eight people in the cast, so it's almost like a chamber film, a chamber piece that takes place over billions of years. It's, it's very weird, and also like three thousand years of longing. Like the the ambition and the oddity did not pay off. And Tom Hanks is neither here nor there when it comes to awards. Him and Robin Wright's comeback or or, or teaming up again that's, is, that's, is appealing. That's to a people. reunion plus the director plus the writer Eric Roth is also a Forrest Gump. Eric Roth is a writer whose movies get nominated all the time though, I will say. He's had six movies that have been nominated for Best Picture. However, he's also writing Dune Part 2 and Killers of the Flower Moon, so it's like, okay, but well, he's got his movies coming. And here's the last year. reason why we should not have this in the tent. It might not come out movie. this year. Oh, really? It's still filming. Oh, oh no, there's an article that says Tom Hanks and Robin Wright will be de-aged for the movie. Okay, so yeah. So you were right. Oh my God, do you do you remember how long The Irishman was pushed back because of de-aging? No, but they said, there was somewhere they said that they were planning on releasing it 2023 awards season. Who's to say they won't just stay on schedule with the de-aging? De-aging's also gotten a lot better. Consider Robert Zemeckis' sensibilities and like being like crowd-pleasing films. I can see them also saying, look, okay, critics aren't gonna like this movie. We're just gonna drop it in December and just make it a theatrical thing and market it as like Robin Wright and, four, and Tom Hanks are back. That would be extremely well, weird. Well, 3,000 Years of Longing was just like, fuck it, we have no idea what this is. I know, and they didn't know who it's for, and that's just yeah. bad all around, like, to not yeah. know who your movie's for. Napoleon, the new Ridley Scott film. The word on the test screenings of this one seems to be that it's, like, okay. Walking Phoenix, Vanessa Kirby, I hope that they give great performances. Maybe this gets a tech or two, but, you know, even, like, stuff like... The Last Duel and Exodus Gods and Kings, they did not get any text. Or Prometheus, that deserved text as well, did not get anything. Really, Scott's last two films also, like, one of them bombed, one of them did really well, but the one that did really well sucked, and the one that bombed was, like, pretty good. <laughs> it also seems a little too, like, old school kind of Oscar movie, I think. It could be good, and it's still not gonna nominate it, that's yeah. why. Yeah. Untitled Ethan Coen movie. Now, I could be a little bit more pumped about this being an awards movie if it didn't just sound so aggressively not Oscar bait. Ethan Coen's, like, trying to make book smart meets a coen brothers crime movie where there's apparently like a briefcase that's what it is it's like an action like comedy road movie with beanie feldstein and margaret qualley like that's what the movie is probably making something fun i think he's writing it with his wife music being done by carter burwell cinematography being done by ari wegner but yeah i don't know next goal wins i i don't have faith in this anymore i mean it's, number it's one is last year this was number 10 on our predictions we've had it in the top 10 in like the last two, two early predictions videos. Yeah. It, has it been three? But we're not doing it this year. This movie has test screen, and from what I've heard, you know, maybe some people think it's decent, but other people are like, eh. This is a case of the, the studio doesn't know what the fuck to do with this because something's wrong. So I'm like, too, like, checked be, out of this movie. I'm just too checked out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it, it might just be, like, a, a fun charmer. If but they, like, like, if they thought it was so good and they were so confident about it, I don't think it would have been pushed back so Well, much. part of it was Army Hammer and replacing him with Will Arnett. The collaboration. This is an interesting one I haven't seen on everybody's list. And really, you know, we're going so long because we're just trying to hit, like, every movie lest we miss any of them. How unfortunate would that be? And we are going to miss something. The screenplay on this one is done by Anthony McCartney. It is based on his own play and it is extremely Two Popes-esque. It's about the coming together Wait. of like two great minds just talking about shit. Paul Bettany is playing Andy Warhol and Jeremy Pope is playing Jean-Michel Basqua. And both of these people played these roles in the stage version of this very play. It's just very too popesy. Maybe Anthony McCartan's kind of on his like better game because that was probably like his best script and maybe it gets acting consideration. Another Two Popes-esque movie is Freud's Last Session. Anthony Hopkins is playing Sigmund Freud. He is conversing with C.S. Lewis, author C.S. Lewis, who is being played by Matthew Good. Apparently they debate the existence of God and Freud's relationship with his lesbian daughter. I don't know. I don't know. The director did The Man Who Knew Infinity with Dev Patel, which got like a 50-something on Metacritic. Who gives a shit? 
The Count, which is a Netflix film from Pablo Lorraine. You know, we do have to keep an eye out for the non-English films this year. Yep. But this year it is a satire on Augusto Pinochet, who is a Chilean general and dictator, and it depicts him as a 250-year-old vampire. I think this movie is going to play with politics that Americans are just not familiar with. I agree with that. And the one image from this makes it look like the tragedy of Macbeth. I don't know if it's going to actually look like that one image. I remember All Quiet on the Western Front, the first images, we thought that would be black and white. The first image we had from Oppenheimer we thought that was going to be black and white and it wasn't but this will probably have great cinematography because of who the director is and it's fucking Edward Lockman who did Carol and Far From Heaven maybe it's a cinematography contender it could even be a film that gets very good critic reviews but just doesn't hit with audiences I feel like I'm supposed to mention Wes Anderson's other movie The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar no but the reason why I'm not going to mention it is because that is a Netflix like Christmas movie that is based off a Roald Dahl anthology What was the problem with The French Dispatch? Was it that it was an anthology? Yes, it was. He's doing another one, and it's probably more of like just like a family piece of content that Netflix is putting out. I don't think it's going to be his best movie this year. I don't know. There are like other movies I could mention. Like One Life also has Anthony Hopkins, but it just sounds like some British like period thing that nobody's going to actually like it's going to take off. People also might want me to talk about Shirley. I heard that not only is it not good, that it might like be bad. Maybe Regina King sticks in, but... I, it might not be good. Spaceman, another Netflix film. Adam Sandler, oh, well, he needs an Oscar nomination because he didn't get nominated for Uncut Gems. Listen, that's not happening either. Paul Dano plays a talking fucking CGI spider. This movie is going to be too weird for the Oscars. And from what I've heard, it's like, was it did, did not really go over well. And it was just oh, like bizarre. So do not get your hopes up for Adam Sandler this year. Wonka, come on. I think Wonka actually might get nominated for some texts. I think it's fairly likely, actually, that it's going to be super mm. extravagant with the production design and costumes. But you do not need to justify why Wonka's not getting nominated for Best Picture. I'm just Thanks. saying Next. it might get, like, four nominations. Next. There's some movies where I'm like, okay, maybe an actor, but I just don't think so overall. I actually am going to boost your maybe for Joyland. I'll make a, an argument where it's like rolling a one and 100 sided die again. Go fucking see it. It's very good. I feel like people kind of looked at that as a last year awards movie because it was submitted for international feature. Yeah. And they're like, we're done with it this year. It's not like time to promote it. Has it has happened before though, that, pe- that films have been submitted for international feature and they actually get released the next year. Who's distributing it? Film Constellation? You think they're going to ca- they're gonna correlate a campaign that revives the movie? Listen, if this got nominated, it would be a grassroots campaign of like unparalleled proportions. Another movie I'm not putting on, Our Apprenticeship from Ryosuke Hamaguchi. I mean... Sure, we have to consider everything, but like, just look at like what this movie's about and then tell me like, oh, he's gonna get another movie into Best Picture? Like, whoa, like chill. He just got one movie. He's been doing movies for a long time. They've been very under the radar. Like, I just don't think he's gonna hit like two in a row. And that'd be insane if he did. Maybe it'll get international feature. Japan's probably gonna be eyeing that or How Do You Live? That's gonna be interesting to see what they submit. I also think it's worth mentioning, you know, for an international film contender, La Chimera, which is the director of Le Pupil. Uh, oh, Alice, Alice Rohrwacher. Yeah, she's Alice Rohrwacher. She did Happy as Lazaro, which has an 87 on Metacritic. But she seems to do, like, kind of quirky movies, mm-hmm. I guess. A little it's, too quirky, like, probably. Yeah, like, could be a little too quirky. Another um, film that I want to point out for international, the director of Timbuktu. Also other stuff, but just nothing was as acclaimed as Timbuktu. It's called The Perfumed Hill. But it's in Chinese. I was looking hard for these international films, and I found, like, these are the couple that I found. Long Day's Journey in Tonight is probably going to be a Best Actress contender. I'd take that very seriously because it's Jessica Lange playing a role that has gotten actresses nominated for uh, probably Tonys and Oscars alike. But I think the movie overall will probably be just her as a player. Let's go for it. Let's just mention Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I think you shouldn't hate that we are mentioning this. It's so Top Gun that I can't do it. I understand. And even Top Gun 1 got like a couple Oscar nominations. Look, that's why I wouldn't like go for it. But what if Tom Cruise hits a streak where this is just as good as Top Gun? People are like, yes, we like this so much. And then they give it a That'd be a little crazy. I can't can't imagine. But if you're going to go there, I'm going to go to John Wick. First of all, John Wick deserves, you know, possibly sound and cinematography and production design. A lot of people are calling it one of the best action films of the decade. It will probably be like on the IMDb top 250 and do what no John Wick movie has done. That is definitely not mean that it's going to be like best picture necessarily, but I'm just saying there's going to be a lot of chatter around the movie when it comes out and there already is a lot of chatter around it. It's maybe like a 0.5% chance, like even less than a 1% chance. I'm just going to rattle off literally everything that I have on here, even stuff that I just didn't want 
don't include. There's a movie called Firebrand that is like a period thing with Alicia Vikander and Jude Law. Costume drama, too old school, maybe costumes. Boo. Chiwetel Ejiofor, who directed a movie that was not even close, is doing another movie that is about like a kid from Newark going to college at MIT or something like that. Nah. Probably not. It has Mary J. Blige in it too. There's an Australian film that's about our Aboriginal people that's directed by like an Aboriginal guy who directs movies about Aboriginal people that are supposed to be like pretty good, but like nobody knows who they are. But Kate Blanchett is like a supporting role in this one that seems like, I don't know, maybe she could bring some attention to it, but that's like a long shot. Um, Why is that a long shot to you? Because it's just going to be like an Australian thing. Also, Ava DuVernay's cast, which could be interesting. It's based off of a nonfiction novel. It sounds like she's constructing a fictional story around like the ideas presented in this nonfiction novel, which makes me wonder if there could be a problem with the movie kind of feeling overly like constructed in terms of arriving to a message, but this movie might not come out this year. So that's why I don't have it on. I also don't have Megalopolis because Megalopolis isn't coming on this year. You can't just say every movie that's in production is gonna come out this year, it's just not true. And I do not believe that Yorgos Lanthimos is and is gonna come out this year. Yes, I know Wes Anderson has maybe two movies coming out, but and is the same studio as Poor Things. Why the hell would they release two of his movies in the same year? Honestly, why would they do it? And The Actor, which is a movie with Andre Holland in the lead role. Everybody who made Anomalisa, who's not Charlie Kaufman, all getting together to make this movie about this actor who's like beaten and left for dead in 1950s Ohio, and then he has amnesia and he's stranded and he's trying to reclaim what he's lost. Perfume Genius is doing the score, which is cool. I don't understand what this is. I guess I'll also just throw out Bottoms from Emma Seligman, who did Shiva Baby, and her new movie premiered at South by Southwest to rave reviews and reactions. Letterboxd loves this thing, but it seems very much like a book smart and maybe it can contend for screenplay, but it is probably not an Oscar contender all around. I do not think that Eileen from Sundance is going to be an Oscar contender. I also don't think Fairplay is an Oscar contender from Sundance. I think Nyad is probably not gonna be a contender, but maybe like Annette Bening or Jodie Foster, but that's just like the speed round of us rattling everything off. So just make sure we didn't forget anything. Those are our Oscar predictions for next year's Oscars. The race has already begun, folks. Air is coming out. We'll have acting predictions coming out next, but you can understand why we didn't do every category because this video was already so long, so long. And we probably won't predict Best Picture again until after can. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Do you know what the international movie that gets in Best Picture will be?